on behalf of the trustees of the uh, IFRS Foundation, the European University Institute, and the Padua Schiopa family, I thank you for joining us for this inaugural memorial lecture in celebration of the life and achievements of Tommaso Padua Schiopa. Uh, Tommaso's brother would have liked to be with us. He sent me a letter, I couldn't make it at the very last meet meeting, and I think I should read to you part of the letter when he expresses the deepest gratitude for this initiative. The ideas, the ideals, and the work accomplished by Tommaso are still with us and will survive his premature death. And it is for comfort to see that an institution like IFRS, that he served with enthusiasm in two phases of his life, is aware of his contribution and cares to preserve the memory of his work and personality. Tommaso was a dear friend and colleague to many of us in the room today, including myself. He devoted his professional life to the public interest and became a prominent figure in the financial community and among pro-Europe activists. He joined the Bank of Italy in 1968 and then developed a brilliant career. He was Vice Director General of the Bank for more than 12 years and he was appointed Chairman of the Italian Securities Regulator, the CONSOB, in 1997. When the European Central Bank was established in 1998, he served on the first six-member executive board. In May 2006, he was appointed Minister of Economy and Finance in the government of Romano Prodi. In his different capacities, he became involved in a number of international think tanks and institutions. He was a member of the influential Group of 30, chairman of the Basel Committee, chairman of the Committee on Payment and Settlement Systems, and chairman of the Top Policy Committee of the International Monetary Fund, to name but a few. Perhaps Tommaso was best known as one of the founding fathers of the Euro. Indeed, the legendary central banker Paul Volcker, who has sent his regrets for not being able to attend today, once referred to Tommaso as, I quote, Europe's ambassador to the financial world, as well as a great European, a great central banker, and a fine personal friend, end of quotation. He was also a leading academic and a brilliant intellectual. He taught at several prominent universities, including the European in University Institute, and published enlightening books on the euro, on financial regulation, and of course, on Europe, una pazienza activa. Since October 2005, he had been chairman of the Paris-based think tank Notre Europe and never abandoned his commitment to the European enterprise. I first met Tommaso in 1997, while Mario Monti had launched the Financial Services Action Plan that would be implemented through the so-called Lamfalusi process, mostly by Fritz Bolkestein. We were both worried to see securities regulators lacking any real European coordination. And Marco Onado, uh, our Italian uh, trustee and uh, commissioner at the CONSOB at that time, shares with me uh, the recollection of these days. At that time, we would meet only once a year for a working session, followed by a nice lunch somewhere in one of the then 15 EU members. Together with our fellow regulators, we set up the first forum of European securities regulators, the FESCO, a self-organized predecessor to CESAR and then ESMA. Our first operational meeting was hosted by Tommaso in Florence at the EUYI. And I shall never forget Tommaso's hospitality, efficiency, subtle diplomacy and humor in leading us to design our organization and working process. He was already an experienced internationalist and even though he was fundamentally a central banker, European securities regulators owe him a lot. His connection to the work of the IFRS Foundation was deep-rooted. In 2005, he succeeded Paul Volcker as chairman of the trustees of the IFRS Foundation, the oversight body of the International Accounting Standards Board, the IASB. His term was cut short when, in 2006, he was asked to become Minister of Finance of Italy. When the financial crisis hit, Tommaso and I again served together in 2009 on the Financial Crisis Advisory Group to the IASB and the FASB, 
who were willing to converge their joint response to the financial crisis. The group was co-chaired by Harvey Goldschmidt and Hans Ogevorst, who would become David Tweedy's successor. Tommaso and I took very similar views, and I believe he was very instrumental in helping to define the delicate balance between the passionate defenders of full fair value versus historic cost and incurred loss versus dynamic provisioning. Tommaso then naturally returned once again to chair the IFRS trustees in 2010, a position he held at the time of his passing. While his terms at the IFRS Foundation were brief because of destiny, his impact was significant. During 2010, Tommaso personally took charge of a far-reaching strategy review of the organization that set out to consolidate the quite remarkable gains of the previous decade while equipping the foundation with the necessary resources to fulfill its mandate as a global accounting standard setter. Today, with international financial reporting standards mandatory for use in more than 100 countries, we are very close to achieving the goal defined by IOSCO in the early 2000s, to provide market participants with one financial reporting language for the purpose of cross-border listings and transactions. Indeed, in little more than 10 years, IFRS has become the de facto global standard for financial information. All significant markets in the world use it for international business, and a huge majority have adopted it for domestic use. Indeed, the world has transitioned to IFRS, providing a high-quality global standard to enhance comparability, reduce risk and cost, and thus promote capital flows and global growth, an objective the G20 is now focused upon. Although Tommaso was a proud European, he recognized that global policy solutions were required to solve the many challenges of capital markets, hence his long-standing support for IFRS as global standards. That is why, at the time of his passing, the trustees decided to join with the EUI and the Pado Askiopa family to create an annual lecture in honor of this great man. As well as celebrating Tommaso's professional achievements, we should not forget his personal charm, warmth, and charisma, all delivered with a wry smile. Spending time in Tommaso's company was always an enjoyable experience and his legacy will live on the hearts and minds of those who had the pleasure of working with him. This event is to celebrate the life of an international statesman, a proud European and a friend. It is testament to Tommaso's achievement that Mario Draghi, president of the European Central Bank, has agreed to travel to London in order to give this inaugural lecture in his honor. I'm grateful to President Draghi for his presence today and look forward to an informative and stimulating lecture. The slides as well as a video recording of this event will be posted on the IFRS website shortly. I would also like to thank Professor Richard Portis for agreeing to offer a few words at the end of the lecture. As well as being a professor of economics at the London Business School, Richard has recently taken up the post of Tommaso Padoaschiopa chair at the European University Institute. Although Richard was born in the United States, he's a UK citizen and also a continental European. He teaches economics in Paris and is a true Parisian by heart due to his love to all things French, especially his wife. <laughs> so we have an excellent program for you this evening, a program that befits the memory of an excellent person I do hope that you will join us for food and drinks immediately afterwards in the Tate Modern Cafe, and I wish you a fruitful evening, and now invite Mario Draghi, president, president of the European Central Bank, to give the memorial lecture. I thank you. Well, dear Michel, I'm very grateful for your kind words, but also for the prestige of this invitation, the opportunity I have to express some views which you will see very close to what Tommaso has been saying all his life, and also the opportunity to be here with uh, colleagues and friends of a lifetime. Uh, dear members of the family of Tommaso, 
dear governor of the Bank of England, dear Mark, ladies and gentlemen, the belief that there are interests of the people that cannot be safeguarded by purely national authorities and that require the establishment of supranational institutions was a constant motivation through the life and work of Tommaso Padua Schioppa. It's also this belief that motivated the involvement of Tommaso in your work, Michel, in your work to develop global accounting standards. More than 100 countries speak the same accounting language today, whereas a decade ago, no major economy used IFRS. I trust that the momentum will be kept, in particular that European policymakers will progress swiftly in the adoption of IFRS 9. But where Tommaso's deep-rooted convictions found their most pronounced expression is in his constant support for European integration, his seminal contribution to the creation of the euro. At the end of a recent press conference, I said that the crisis would not have been as severe if we had more, if we had had more integration, not less integration in Europe. And that our future lies with more integration, not renationalization of our economies. And I suspect that Tommaso would have agreed with this. Sovereignty in the European Union is not only a normative concept linked to the rights of states, it's also a positive concept. A sovereign that cannot effectively deliver the expectations of its citizens is only sovereign in name. Genuine sovereignty exists only if policymaking is effective. This notion of the efficacy of public powers is reflected in the principle of subsidiarity embedded in the EU treaties, or what is known as the Federalist Principle in the United States, the logic of which was elegantly captured by John Locke in 1680s. For all power given with trust for attaining an end, whenever that end is manifestly neglected, that power must devolve in the hands of those that gave it, who may place it anew where they shall think best for their safety and security. European integration has, in effect, been a process of progressively applying this principle. Governments have pulled sovereignty every time it has proved necessary so that they could continue to deliver on their duties towards their people. At the start of the process, the objective was to prevent continental and other continental war. Two world wars had demonstrated the inability of European governments acting alone to provide physical security for their citizens. Thus, they established, they established common institutions such as the Coal and Steel Authority that could more effectively guarantee peace. In parallel, and quite independent of policy actions, economic integration has also progressed in a more gradual but also more continuous process. Such integration results indeed at least as much from technological developments and improvements in transportation and communication as it does from policy choices. It is in large part inescapable. But because it creates far-reaching interdependencies, it has required governments to respond. They have had to proactively choose to pool sovereignty to regain control of their economies. With the establishment of the single market, in particular, the pace and reach of integration accelerated markedly. This was, of course, its purpose, and it remains the most significant and successful achievement of the European Union. But a free market does not only assume the freedom to take part, it also assumes the means to protect that freedom, by which I refer to the protection of, pro of property rights, the enforcement of contracts, the conditions of fair competition, and the avoidance of moral hazard. Economic integration, therefore, required integration of some economic policies. The euro itself emerged, in fact, as a corollary of the single market. It was conceived as early as the late 50s 
as a response to the costs associated with exchange rate frictions within a single market, which was, at the beginning, a market for agricultural products only. Already in 1944, in an influential study commissioned by the League of Nations, the great economist Ragnar Nerx had warned convincingly of the economic losses resulting from currency volatility. Tommaso himself, after, argued in his inconsistent quartet that free trade, free capital movement, fixed exchange rates, and independent monetary policies were ultimately incompatible. And the euro itself has had consequences. Some of these were identified early, in particular with respect to fiscal governance. Some were fully acknowledged only later, such as the pervasive effects of macroeconomic imbalances. But in both cases, the crisis showed that the cohesion of the Union relied, in fact, on the behavior of each of its members. This is why I believe that the case for community-level governance does not apply only to fiscal policy or to the banking union, but also to structural reforms, as I will endeavor to explain in a moment. The case for fiscal governance at the community level is well understood and stems from the negative externalities that unsound public finances in a member state can generate for its neighbors. The crisis not only validated this concern, it reinforced it by showing that externalities could be even more pervasive than initially thought. The fiscal soundness of one government is obviously first and foremost in the interest of its own country. Countries with excessively stretched public finances can lose the ability to use fiscal policy as a counter-cyclical stabilization tool. Indeed, this ability relies on the government being able to access markets at favorable conditions at the time when it needs it. That is to say, at the trough of the cycle. As we've seen during the crisis, this cannot be taken for granted when doubts arise about the sustainability of the debt. This would be problematic anywhere, but it's more so in a monetary union, as the common monetary policy can only aim at price stability for the euro area as a whole. It cannot cater specifically for asymmetric shocks. In the absence of a federal budget like we see in the United States, the soundness of government credit everywhere is of paramount importance to counteract regional slumps. If some governments retain the ability to stabilize their economies but others do not, then it becomes more plausible that economic divergence occurs. This is one channel through which the cohesion of the union can be affected. This ability depends on keeping debt low and budget deficits close to zero when output grows at potential, not on having more flexibility in existing rules. Keeping one's own house in order also has a further benefit. It helps mitigate the effects of contagion. As we've seen during the crisis, those governments that had more robust fiscal positions were much less affected by contagion. At the extreme, they even benefited from being a safe haven. This protection, however, is not absolute because it relies on the ability of markets to discriminate between sound and unsound debtors. Yet, bubbles and panics happen. A bubble is a situation where markets ignore fundamentals even if debtors are unsound. And you, we've seen that for too long, markets fail to raise funding costs for countries with unsustainable fiscal policies. And a panic is a situation where markets also ignore fundamentals, but this time to the detriment of sound debtors. In fact, the main channel of contagion within a monetary union is not direct exposures between one country and another. It is the fact that if a precedent set in one country is seen to be replicable elsewhere, it can affect the conditions of market access for all. Put differently, the main channel of financial contagion is not the asset side of balance sheets, 
but it's the liability side. We perhaps saw this effect most clearly with the fragmentation of the banking sector three years ago. Fears that one country could leave the euro resulted not just in that country being cut off financially, but in fragmentation everywhere. This fragmentation created considerable damage. The renationalization of finance hindered the homogeneous transmission of monetary policy across borders. And it resulted in a divergence of financial conditions across the euro area. This initiated an economic divergence process, which in turn could have challenged the sustainability of the euro area. The ECB therefore had to act, and we did, through the creation of the Outright Monetary Transactions, or MT program, to nip in the bud unwarranted fears of a euro area breakup and prevent an adverse equilibrium from becoming entrenched to prophes through prophecies that were as much false as they were self-fulfilling. It was necessary to protect the monetary transmission process. It was necessary to protect price stability, which is essential for the cohesion of the euro area. The threats to price stability today do not come from unfounded fears of a breakup of the euro, but from the consequence of changes in other factors, such as energy and food prices, relative price adjustment in stressed countries, exchange rate behavior, weak demand, and high unemployment. Nonetheless, those threats are real, and to cope with them, the governing council is determined to keep the monetary policy stance accommodative for an extended period of time. Moreover, the governing council is unanimous in its commitment to use also unconventional instruments within its mandate should it become necessary to further address risks of too prolonged a period of low inflation. We are strongly determined to safeguard the firm anchoring of inflation expectations over the medium to long term. The lesson I draw from the fragmentation we have experienced in, in, is that the cohesion of the Union is a fundamental interest of all its members. If it is called into question, as we've experienced firsthand, the consequences cannot be anticipated with total certainty, but they are detrimental to all. It is therefore of considerable relevance and importance that Europe has already made extensive progress in strengthening its rules, for example, through the fiscal compact. What is essential now is that these rules are enforced. To unwind the consolidation that has been achieved, and in doing so to divest the rules of credibility, would be self-defeating for all countries for three reasons. First, the high level of indebtedness in almost all euro area countries implies a higher vulnerability to market pressure and contagion. If the euro area faces further economic or financial shocks. The probability of falling into a bad equilibrium where high rates induce defaults is higher the higher is the debt of the country. Second, if fiscal rules are applied by national governments for achieving not only stability but also sustainable growth, they do not, in my view, clash with national ownership of the budget. Fiscal rules should be viewed in the national debate as promoting growth-friendly fiscal consolidation and not simply as a painful accounting exercise. Third, respecting the rules matters because it's a prerequisite for any other form of integration. It's only by demonstrating a willingness to fulfill their commitments that member states can achieve the degree of mutual trust that is a prerequisite for integration in other areas. Indeed, any pooling of sovereignty required a great deal of mutual confidence, in particular in the fiscal area, which is traditionally seen as a prerogative of national parliaments. This same reasoning that I am applying for the fiscal framework can, to a substantial extent, 
be extended to other areas of economic policy. In particular, I think there is a case for some form of common governance over structural reforms. This is because the outcome of structural reforms, a continuously high level of productivity and competitiveness, is not merely in a country's own interest. It is in the interest of the union as a whole. The single market and the single currency were conceived as a sort of Ricardian union, meaning a union in which each country, each sector, and each firm can exploit its comparative advantage. I do not think there is any disagreement that the single market was a success. But it's not enough for the cohesion of the union that the single market and the single currency constitute a positive sum gain in the sense that their existence raises aggregate welfare. The cohesion of the euro area relies on the fact that it is Pareto improving. It must be the case that all the countries are better off inside the union than they would be on the outside. And it's obviously not enough that this is true only at the moment when they join. It has to be true continuously. There are many instances around the world of political unions whose cohesion is maintained because the weaker regions of states benefit from recurrent fiscal transfers from their peers, typically through the operations of a central budget. It is then possible for those weaker regions to maintain recurrent external deficits, while the stronger regions post permanent surpluses. This is the case in the United States, for instance, but it's also true within most individual countries in Europe. In the Euro era, however, while there are cohesion funds for catching up countries and private credit flows can finance temporary imbalances, permanent fiscal transfers between member states are not envisaged. So, in the medium term, each economy has to stand on its own feet. It has to be productive and competitive enough to benefit from the opportunities afforded by the single market. We can do and have done much to reduce imbalances that those imbalances that are generated by factors other than lack of competitiveness and structural weaknesses. External imbalances have been reducing since the announcement of OMTs. Persistent imbalances, however, could eventually undermine the economic and political cohesion of our union. And as I have already discussed, any threat to the cohesion and sustainability of the union has pervasive effects for all in the form of contagion and uncertainty, which weighs on investment. This is where structural reforms play a crucial role and perhaps an even more important role in the euro area than in other unions. Markets can be opened through EU legislation, but it's only through structural reforms that firms and individuals can be enabled to take full advantage of that openness. I would even say that structural reforms are fundamental to reap the benefits of our recent monetary policy decisions. Our recent monetary policy decisions expand credit, bank credit, but for firms, companies, to access this credit, they must be in a condition to work. If it takes nine months to open a new business, and then once it's open, it's overwhelmed by taxation, it's very hard for this business to ask for credit. Indeed, the intention of the single market was to free individuals and firms within a market where no distinction would be made on account of nationality or place of establishment. This is why competition policy is enforced at the EU level so that no firm is protected by its nationality. By the same token, no firm or individual should be penalized by its country of residence. Yet, firms face very different operating environments across the euro area, which can prevent them from exploiting the advantages of the market. For example, the World Economic Forum ranks Finland third in the world in terms of global competitiveness, whereas Greece ranks 91st. The World Bank ranks Ireland 15th in the world in terms of ease of, ease of doing business, where Malta 
ranks 103rd. The persistence of such differences creates the risk of permanent imbalances. With this in mind, I believe the structural reforms in each country are enough of a common interest to justify that they are made subject to discipline at community level. I see two reasons why this approach could be favorable to national governments today. The first is that we've seen over the past few years both the risks associated with insufficient competitiveness in some member states and the benefits of structural reforms. We have witnessed the accumulation of external imbalances in peripheral economies prior to the crisis and how that left them vulnerable to sudden stop dynamics. And more recently, we've seen the improvement that has taken place when governments implemented reform. The change in current account positions in stressed countries ranges from an almost 11 percentage points of GDP correction in Spain to a 16 percentage point of GDP improvement in Greece, of which only part is explained by lower imports in the context of a recession. In fact, the return of market confidence in the euro area results in good part from the acknowledgement that individual governments, in particular, in some of the most stressed countries, have taken significant corrective action and will continue to do so where needed. So, while lack of reform can threaten the cohesion of the Union, we can already see how decisive reform can actually strengthen it. But we are only at the beginning. The final judgment now rests in us being able to show that cohesion also produces growth and jobs. The second reason why a stronger role for the Union could be beneficial is that similarly to fiscal policies, establishing rules at the level of the Union may in fact help national authorities, especially the weaker national authorities, to implement reforms. Structural reforms reach deep enough into societal arrangements and practices that they can only succeed if they are made the object of strong domestic ownership. At the same time, those reforms require substantial political capital. Historical experience, for example, of the IMF makes a convincing case that the discipline imposed by supranational bodies can make it easier to frame the debate on reforms at national level. Particularly, the debate can be framed not in terms of whether, but in terms of how reforms need to take place. In other words, I'm not convinced by the argument that in terms of structural reforms, there is an opposition between rules and ownership. On the contrary, they can be mutually reinforcing. In conclusion, there is a strong case for us to apply the same principles to the governance of structural reforms as we do to fiscal governance. The essential cohesion of the Union depends on it. With the benefit of hindsight, it would, be, it would have been useful to establish alongside the existing convergence criteria a set of structural criteria that had to be met in order to enter the euro area and then respected once inside. But we have to start from where we are. Thus, I would see merits in initiating as a one-off a new convergence process within the euro area, one which ensures that all countries are truly in a position to benefit from membership and, none, and that none cause harm to another. Today, national governments are not able to fully exercise their sovereignty alone. Whether sovereignty is defined normatively, a la Jean Baudin, in terms of inalienable rights, such as declare war and treat the conditions of peace, to judge in last resort, to raise taxes or mint money, or whether it's defined positively, a la John Locke, in terms of a fiduciary power to act for certain ends. Individually, they're they simply not powerful enough to serve their purpose 
they have to learn to govern together. They have to learn to be sovereign together as to respond to their citizen needs. And these needs today are growth and job creation. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to respond to this very challenging speech by Mario Draghi in honor of Tommaso Paolo Schiopo. I first met Tommaso 30 years ago. Initially, it was just a professional relationship, but then when he bought a lovely country house outside Chitona, uh, I discovered it was a rather nice place to visit, and they couldn't keep me away. So we developed a close personal friendship over the years. And my family and I, in fact, still go to that area, just to the west of it, now uh, in the Val d'Orce, for holidays in the summer. Um, uh, I differ from both Tommaso and from our speaker in one key respect. I am not and will never be a central banker. Uh, and in particular, I've never held a post in either the Banca d'Italia or the European Central Bank. Nor is this likely. Um, I already have three jobs, one of which brings me here uh, before you tonight. Uh, but there is one key common characteristic, I hope, and that is citizenship of the European Union. Tommaso was a European to the core, as is Mario. I have the citizenship, but I'm still working on the substance. Uh, uh, they are both inspiring examples of how that commitment can go together with a strong sense of national identity. I hope that the Scottish voters will feel similarly about the UK in the September referendum, and that my fellow UK citizens will recognize how fortunate they are to be citizens of the European Union. I agree with Mario that the crisis would not have been as severe if we had had more integration, in particular, a true banking union and an acknowledged capacity of the ECB to act as a lender of last resort for the Euro area. Since the crisis, however, we have indeed seen financial fragmentation, the reversal of the financial integration that had progressed under the Financial Services Action Plan and Monetary Union. The renationalization of finance shows in a very wide range of data. And it's true that the ECB's OMT initiative has reversed the vicious circle that seemed to be leading to the bad equilibrium the breakup of the monetary union itself, but we are still far from the good equilibrium. Mario is absolutely right to say that the future lies with more economic and financial integration, not the renationalization of our economies. We must decisively reverse this disintegration of the past five years. The very limited steps so far taken towards banking union are not adequate, in my view. They should be only a beginning. And it is important to say in this country that, I quote, genuine sovereignty exists only if policymaking is effective. Trade, capital flows, and cross-border movements of persons tie national economies more closely today than ever before, regardless of their institutional relationships. There is a global financial cycle. Supply chains are global. Intellectual property is global. To see national sovereignty as a way of escaping these ties is simply illusory. And in the European Union, we have indeed pooled sovereignty to great positive effect. Mario is right, too, that the single market remains the most significant and successful achievement of the EU. Again, that should resonate in the UK, which was, from the outset, fully behind the single market. And I recall with total clarity Tommaso's dinner speech at a CEPR conference in Perugia on the 15th of October 1987, in which he set out why the single market must lead to monetary union. EMU is, after all, economic and monetary union. Mario said that the main channel of financial contagion is not the asset side of balance sheets, but the liability side. Yes, 
and that is why the AQR and stress tests are only part of assessing individual banks and systemic stability. The comprehensive assessment will not be properly comprehensive until the EBA and the single supervisory mechanism devote as much attention to the funding of banks as to their assets. On the fiscal, and here I have to quote from Tommaso. Now it's an early, it's an early, well, not that early, but it's an early essay um, uh, from 1990. But he, in a chapter in this excellent book uh, called The Road to Monetary Union in Europe, wrote, the main conclusion of this section is that the arguments for a transfer of power to the community in the budgetary field are not decisive. He might have revised that view subsequently. Um, I couldn't find anything that he had actually written directly on this issue. Mario says that fiscal rules are necessary to limit negative externalities, and they must be enforced. The commitments have been made. Credibility is necessary for confidence and mutual trust. But if the rules are too rigid and they overly constrain sensible macroeconomic policies, then they should be re-examined. Yes, countries should honor their commitments, but they can also agree collectively to revise those commitments if they are inappropriate. The current fiscal compact was inspired by a misunderstanding, I believe, in the role of fiscal policy in macroeconomic stabilization and also of the source of the crisis. In the period 1999 to 2008, fiscal policy was seriously lax in only one stressed, what we nowadays call stressed country, Greece. Fiscal profligacy was not responsible for the predicaments of Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and others. Tying ourselves to the overly contractionary fiscal policies of the past few years will simply prolong the recession, which has not really ended. Output is far from potential, and that has implications for fiscal policy as well as for monetary policy. Yes, there is a strong case, and now we turn to what I think is the heart of Mario's speech. There is a strong case for common governance over structural reforms. That was, after all, recognized in the single market program. Both harmonization and mutual recognition are forms of common governance. We do not have a fiscal transfer union in the European Union or the Euro area, and we shall not in the foreseeable future. It might be justifiable as a cyclical stabilizer, but long-run one-way transfers would be undesirable as well as politically unacceptable. Persistent trade imbalances financed by persistent private capital flows are rather different. And when capital flows drive the trade flows, that too is something else. And that is indeed my interpretation of the Eurozone crisis. The huge capital flows from the core to the periphery went primarily into the non-traded goods sector, driving up the relative price of non-tradables, which is equivalent to a real exchange rate appreciation. That was the loss of competitiveness and the source of external imbalances, not a divergence in unit labor costs. So restoring competitiveness is not best achieved by euro devaluation or by internal devaluation, as it's called. Rather, Mario is absolutely right to advocate a new effort for structural reforms disciplined at the EU level. I reiterate, we do already have, in principle, such a discipline. We are simply not respecting it. The best way to reduce the relative price of, of non-tradables is by freeing the markets for services, as envisioned in the single market program, and forcing competition in areas like taxis, legal services, financial services, pharmacies, retailing, I could go on. These are essential structural reforms. But the vested interests are strong, so national governments do need help at the supranational level. Many of the necessary rules are there. Others could well be added. An EU-wide effort with appropriate subsidiarity could support national ownership. And there again, I think that's an important part of what Mario is proposing. That is the key message of tonight's speech, and I hope it will find wide support, not just in this audience. We are very grateful indeed for Mario Draghi's articulation of why we need the European Union to go forward, not backward, and for choosing the Tommaso Padovskiopa memorial speech as the occasion for this powerful statement. Thank you very much on behalf of us all.